This is the OGM call for September 19th, 2024. Today is Talk Like a Pirate Day. So, ye mighties, we'll keel haul you if you don't make the right answers. And I feel like I'm feeling for not having a parrot on my shoulder and a patch on my eye. But if you can imagine those, or I think one of the video effects uh, on Zoom probably is the parrot, uh, the, the pirate, if I remember. So I will do that between sessions. But uh, it is Talk Like a parrot, parrot Day, which goes back to a Dave Barry column that turned into reality, as, as comedy sometimes does. Just look at the government of Ukraine. Um, we are a topic less, topic free, uh, topic fancy free today. Uh, and I was interested partly in doing a little meta conversation about our structure and then diving into um, what we'd like to talk about. Uh, I We heard a proposal to go to one check-in call a month or fewer check-in calls maybe, which I'm interpreting as, hey, why don't we take one week a month and do check-in and the rest of the time uh, stick on topics, a proposal I really kind of like. Uh, because it feels like we don't have much energy between uh, topic calls because they're distant by they're distanced by a uh, a check-in call. And it feels like the check-in calls are often similar to one another. I really appreciate the Quaker meetingness of the check-in calls. Um, but otherwise, I'm open let, let's spend a moment on that. I'm open to hearing what anybody feels about them or if there's a strong uh, strong defense for them or whatever. Uh, Mr. Kaminsky, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mikulski. Um, I, I, uh, I understand the impulse to say, you know, these seem like a waste of time. Um, and uh, like, I don't know. Uh, another observation I had that I did, don't think came up really is that we, I think we started off like many other calls doing check-ins in the front. And then at some point we figured out that check-ins in the front meant that we would never get to a topic. And so then we kind of declared, uh, let's just do check-in calls. The, so I, I get that it can kind of feel like a waste of time, but I also think the amount of time we spend with each other not talking about a topic and learning about each other uh, has helped us be a better group brain. And so uh, a thing that, uh, that, I noted, uh, that I've noticed over the past like three, four, five, six months, something like that, is we can, we can talk together about pretty deep topics uh, and, and not like go sideways with, uh, the whole team kind of going in different directions. We actually are really good at sticking together and talking through something. And I think a large part of that is because we have spent a long time not talking about something we've talked about each other and how we feel and how I feel and things like that. And I think that that makes a big difference in the way that we interact with each other. So I'm kind of mixed, uh, you know, it would be great to to be able to cover quite quote unquote more ground uh, with more topics or you know more time to do topics, I'm not sure that that would actually accomplish what we think would accomplish. So I think it may be really good to to keep the top uh, the check-in calls at the frequency that we've got. Just two cents. Thank you, Pete. Um, and I will I will point out that this doesn't the proposal doesn't get rid of check-in calls it reduces their frequency so it's not like we wouldn't have the check-in so i think part of our read on ourselves is do we need to have every do we need to have 50 percent of the calls be check-ins or can it be some smaller number i'm arbitrarily saying uh first one of the month or something like that it could be every third call i don't know i'm you know we could, I, we could I, wiggle I think the difference between uh 50 and 30 percent or 25 percent or whatever i think it's a big deal um even though it may seem like we could cheat and get away with it it's one of those uh, uh slowest smooth smoothest fast kinds of things um uh being humans uh one of the things that that humans need to do is do a lot of uh interface stuff um uh what what another group i have i was in called fatic drivel Fatic is a word that means like you're just chit-chatting kind of and you're not actually doing signal. Um, that group also, I was totally surprised how much of the time we just like chit-chatted and it seemed like nothing was going on and we weren't going, getting anywhere. But if you look at the arc over time, um, it was a good cohesive group because of that chit-chat that seems like a waste of time. I, I think it's not a waste of time, even though it might feel like it. I'm also, I will have been pleasantly surprised to hear a defense of our check-in calls, which I thought were starting to irritate a few people as well. So uh, thanks, Pete. Stacy. Hi. 
Um, yeah, I agree with what Pete said. And I just want to say on the days that we don't have a check-in call, I would love to see like a 30 second go around in case anybody brought something with them. So for example, today, if that were the case, I'd be saying, hey, everybody, check out what Jack Park forwarded regarding Mark Prensky's new book. It's a great video. And I think after watching it, we could have some great discussions. I know Mike Nelson was there. I would want to push back on his pushback. So I think it could be a nice addition to add on to something. Um, thanks, Lizzie. Um, thanks, Lizzie. And, uh, I'm hearing my voice echo someplace. I don't know exactly where. Uh, uh, over to you, Gil. Yeah, um, I'm open to the experiment, Jerry. Uh, I'd be willing to try that for a month or two and see what it's like and see how it's different. Um, uh, I also like the alternative of a very, very short check-in at the beginning of every call, maximum 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. That takes us, what, like, you know, six minutes or maybe 10 minutes uh, to keep the FATIC orientation. But um, um, I'm not, um, I don't feel strongly about this because I also lean to what Pete said. Uh, about the relationship building. And I, I just was watching before we came on, I didn't have time to post it to the group, a conversation between uh, with Dave Snowden and Nora Bateson in Finland recently. Um, and the first few minutes, Snowden blew my mind about complexity, stuff I had never heard before that was as penetrating and you know really um, reorienting. Uh, but he went on to talk about change process and asserted, if, can I go, if I can just go for 30 seconds on this, it's okay. relevant. Um, um, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to erase the background story here. Yeah. Um, you, you, he says you can't change complex systems by trying to change an element of the system. You can't change social behavior by trying to change individual people. You have to change the relationships between them. And talked about work they've done with uh, people from multiple conflict zones where they do not talk about what they agree about and disagree about. They take people, you know, like from from uh, uh, um, you know you, Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Gaza and take them to the slums of Brazil and stick them there for six months. And when those people find they have come to enough of a relationship to talk about their own stuff, they talk about their own stuff, but it comes mm -hmm. out of something else. So that's a sort of digressional support for what Pete is saying about the importance of us just hanging together and talking about whatever, in addition to more focused conversations about stuff. The other, the other question I'd raise about thematic conversations is that uh, we rarely uh, pursue a topic sequentially over a bunch of sessions. It's probably harder to do if we're alternating with check-in calls. Uh, we did it around the democracy stuff a few months ago where we did three in a row, I think it was, or four in a row four. on a topic. Uh, and so that maybe, you know, so, so there's like a third alternative. One is that we do the alternating thematic check-in one is that we do fewer check-in, more thematic, and fourth is that we find a way to do more continuity across themes over time. And yeah, Pete, thank you. You beat me to it for posting the link. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Um, that's the right link, Gil? Well, I have it as a direct YouTube, which I put in here. It might well be the same. That, is, that is the same link if you look at the, the tail yep. end of it. Yep. Good. Uh, Mark, please. Um. The reason I come here is um, for what collaboration is possible. And certainly, um, I want to know my collaborators. And I have found this to be a very, what, um, where people basically talk about their own stuff, but not how we're working together. Um, certainly, um, Pete has, um, created a number of software systems that, um, I could collaborate with and, and help on. I've been a little challenged, um, in terms of my, um, focus, um, recently, but, um, uh, you know, I'm still here for open global mind, basically how, um, and it does not look like mind scales um i'm inspired by some of the things that uh i think doug wrote in that i saw in the uh um newsletter um about you know social um character 
and certainly a small group of committed people can change the world. Are we committed? Um, that's my question, and that question is unanswered by being here for several years. Um, I don't know why anybody else is here in, in terms of, hey, um, I'm really going to spend 30 hours with Jerry over the next month to advance something. And that something is, is unknown. Um, I have ideas, or let me put it this way, concepts of a plan. Do you have, do you have thoughts of concepts? <laughs> <laughs> More notions of thoughts, but... I, I, I love that. You know, it's here, like here materializing. We go. Um, uh, yeah, so how do I work with Doug? How do I work with Stacy? How do I work with... Um, uh, I was uh, going to attempt to work with... Um, uh, uh, and again, chemo brain, I forget names, but uh, the guy who lives in North Carolina who um, uh, does incredible... Kevin Jones. Yes, yes. And he had a um, uh, a way of linking concepts and people that um, uh, we, when I first met him and had the possibility to work with him a decade ago, I kind of thought, huh, this is something that I could either run with or or contribute to. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I have some uh, difficulties, um, poverty being uh, a, an important difficulty, but um, um, that is uh, you know, why I'm here and what I'm hoping to understand. Um, certainly, you know, Gil, um, can help me with some coaching, but I don't have any money to pay Gil. Um, I could help Gil with, I don't know, software or something like that. But um, uh, all that kind of coordination is above and beyond the kinds of conversations that we're having in these calls for me. Um, maybe it's working for other people. Um, and uh, Sam raised his hand, so I'm going to lower mine. I think Sam is uh, saying hi because he's just joined our conversation. Uh, hey, Sam, uh, great to see you. We're doing a little meta conversation about uh, OGM and about our calls and, and call structure and things like that. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm kind of new here. Oh, am I the wrong Sam? Sorry. Never mind. Oh, sorry. I forgot there's two <laughs> Sams. Usually we have two Dougs, but uh, as we do as we do today. So I'm going to have to say Sam H and Sam S or something like that. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to I'm getting a call. I'll be right back, though. Thanks. Um, cool. And, and Mark, you made me think of a couple things that I wanted to put in the conversation. Uh, one is that uh, as far as Open Global Mind had or has a mission, we've been doing lots and lots of mission drift. We've been sort of all over the place. And I, I don't know that we have a, a, any kind of crisply focused, this is what Open Global Mind does and is aiming for, et cetera, et cetera, as IndieWeb or Fediverse projects have, or as a platform a cooperative has, or, or you know, many others we can point to. Um, we don't do a lot of collimation, uh, as you pointed out. We're we're each reporting in on what we're doing, and I think that there's a lot of collaborations that are happening outside of our our reporting in and view here. I think a lot of people meet up and do stuff, uh, or hire one another for projects or whatever. I know there's a bunch of people who don't show up for OGM anymore because they met in an OGM Zoom or or, two, or three and then went off and just, you know hightailed it to do something, and that that's very cool. Um, my moderation technique or skills tend much more towards stewarding of a space than shepherding of a mission. Um, I think I'm much more of a steward than a shepherd. Uh, I'm interested in us, you know achieving stuff but i don't know that that's that we've had some of that conversation here part of it we're, we're we're here to be here and to be here for one another and one of the nice things about check-in calls is that they make extra space for us to just uh, soften up and hear each other with a different quality of listening and quality of speaking which i uh, i do value greatly um open to other thoughts on um and sam the the proposal on the table that came up uh, sorry sam h the proposal, actually, for both of you, um, I, although Sam S, I think, uh, dropped off for his call. Um, the proposal on the table is to change the the frequency of our check-in calls. Right now, we alternate, so 50% uh, of our calls are check-in format, where I step out 
and don't moderate and people just step in and do a, a bit of a check-in. Then once everybody's checked in, we turn back to regular discourse. And uh, the proposal was to, to taper that back instead of every other call to one call a month. So have it, having the frequency, um, that's kind of what we're up to. Other thoughts, other feelings about this? Uh, Sam S. Um, it's, it's probably bad form to talk on your first visit to a group like this, but just thought I'd relay that um, my parents uh, were, you know, hippies, back to the land hippies, and a bunch of them landed in uh, this place. And first thing that women did, of course, was get together and talk about each other and really get to know each other well. And that was the foundation for the community. So um, I don't know how much in these checking calls you guys really talk about each other, like or talk about your, you know, your you know, childhoods, all that kind of stuff. But that was what they were doing and, and it created a lot of community. So I just thought I'd share that. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, we do some every now and then it shows up, you know, more about our lives shows up. Um, um, Mark uh, is courageous and does that um, sometimes with us. Um, I think because he trusts us as a group, which I love, uh, but we don't spend all that much time in those spaces. So thanks for pointing out that that helps build community enormously. I agree. And Sam, um, it's my invitation um, because I know most of the other folks in this call by repeated interaction. Please introduce yourself um, if that uh, is okay with the rest of the group. And Sam, if you want to take a moment to sort of say where you're coming from, that'd be great. Sure. Um, okay. Let's see. Where do you start? Um, let's see. I'm calling from Amsterdam, Netherlands. Um, I've got two kids here and, um, yeah, I'm probably like all of you, I'm, you know, live most of my life in the States and I, um, I grew up in Canada as, uh, like my parents were hippies, as I mentioned. And so sort of back to the land and, you know, fear of the collapse of the, supply chain and all that kind of stuff and um, so it oriented me in a lot of different ways i'm a naturopathic physician and um for those who don't know i prescribe drugs and do all the diagnosis but i also am uh, well versed in diet and nutrient therapies and exercise prescription counseling botanical medicine that kind of stuff um which would be kind of useful if there were no drug stores around um and let's see um i'm working on some governance software called forby which um, is part of why I'm here. I, I'm very interested in, you know, people like yourselves who, who think about this. I want to just kind of steep myself in as much, what's that saying? I would, I, I want all the brain, I use all the brains I have and all I can borrow kind of thing. So I'm just, um, and I feel like you guys are kind of having very interesting conversations about this. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. And, and other things to talk about, you know, talking about the government and stuff and, you know, like, uh, politics and, ecology and agriculture and all that. those are all things I'm very interested in as well. So um, let me think if I can say anything else. Nah, I don't know. I mean, there's lots I could say, but I think that's probably a good start. Thanks. That was, that was perfect. Um, really appreciate it. Anyone else thoughts on frequency of uh, calls? Shall we uh, go ahead, Ken? Yeah, um, I, I would amplify and, and um, very much heartily agree with what Pete said. Um, I think that the, the time we take to get to know each other is critically important. And um, maybe if we want to do more, you know, it, currently we we switch every other week is uh, check in every other week is topic. There are months when we have an extra week. So maybe um, sticking with the current frequency, but on the months we have an extra week, then we have an extra topic. Might be a reasonable way to at least test the water i think that's like one or two months a year or that where there's five weeks <clears throat> don't ask me to do math i facilitate because i'm not a math person yeah, yeah i totally understand um let me float the idea of testing uh one check-in call a month for two months and see all in favor raise your hand i'm not big a fan of voting medium uh all opposed raise your hand I wouldn't be opposed if we had that 30 second or one minute 
thing that I suggested, then I'd be all for it. Which I can test, which is the thing I can test as well. Uh, I'm voting for it, but I think it's a dumb idea. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to test out, test drive a dumb idea. I'm on electoral tradition. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, so for the next two months, we will do uh, first Thursday of every month will be a check-in, but first 10 minutes of every call will be a very swift check-in like one or two sentences. Did you see this? I, I just did this amazing thing, whatever, whatever. Um, and if we want to refine how that works, I'm open to all proposals on that as well. Pete. We could pass. Or I, you can pass. I just want to, you could pass, yeah. Yep. It's 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 interesting. One of the I think one of the values of the check-in calls is is making sure everybody at least has a chance to go, an opportunity to go or or have to pass. Um, because People don't always check in, uh, especially when they most need to, kind of. Um, uh, I was going to say, I, I, I'm glad we're doing something interesting and having an experiment. Uh, if we were, I don't know, if, if we were uh, studious or something, uh, we would tr try to do at least a little science and, and have a, some qualitative questionnaire at this point. How have topic calls been going? How have check-in calls been going? How productive do you think you are in moving through topics? I, I wouldn't ask it that way, um, uh, but I would try to get at that question. And then, you know, we would have that sort of, that we would run those questions again uh, in three months or whatever. Um, I, don't, I don't think that we have the bandwidth to do that. So um, that makes me a little bit sad, but I'm also totally cool with the fact that we don't have enough bandwidth to do that kind of thing. If anybody else feels they have the bandwidth to create a simple, quick questionnaire and float it on the OGM list, please, please do so. We are completely, a, it's a great idea. A trick is to make an effective questionnaire and not, simple is probably good, but you don't, but you don't necessarily ask direct questions when you're doing an effective questionnaire. So Could I, you I, perhaps I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to take the time to, to answer dumb questions. Um, I think we would want to do it smart. I'm willing to bet you could coax a GPT into creating such a questionnaire that would meet your description relatively swiftly. Yeah. Um, cool. Klaus. Yeah, I don't know if we're ready to move on and uh, get into a topic or not. But uh, in any case, I was intrigued by Stacy's question earlier um, on, on, the, on the email thread to take a look at what the Heritage Foundation Project 2025 is actually saying about agriculture. So I just ran this by. Um, my GPT actually required seven seconds to, to read the entire 1,200 pages mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and extract some points out of it. It's actually quite interesting. Um, so you know, instead of reading it the in a nutshell, <clears throat> the intention is that uh, um, there will be a, a significant reduction in regulations, um, which means keep going as we are with an industrial food system. Um, and uh, the impact on small to medium-sized farmers would be quite catastrophic because they depend so much on, on market support. So the... the uh, uh, that's actually an interesting question, Stacy, because by extracting very specific uh, impacts on on industries, right, and on uh, uh, may maybe more narrow components of the economy, uh, we can we can understand the the, the direction and and impacts better. So I thought that was a that was a uh, uh, that was a good path to pursue here. Thank you. Thanks, Klaus. And your timing is good. I think we're we're at that bend where we want to dive into some some topics and get going because we kind of wrapped up the last uh, the last topic. Uh, Mark, um, I salute that we're doing experiments. But when we do experiments, I love what Pete said. Let's do a little bit of science. Um, I'm still unclear why we are doing this experiment and what is the what's the success or or failure um what kinds of results are we are we looking for i mean when i 
do an experiment in science, I I have you know an objection, um, a a a a guess of of what kinds of things are are happening, and I've heard a number of different things, but I haven't collimated or or coordinated those um, ideas. Yes, experiment, um, but we're a group, so we have different positions on why or or why not um i certainly know that we have email we have the collective sense commons um i posted is there a theme to this morning's call to kind of you know prepare a little bit um a little you know that was at 7 55 so i had five minutes to prepare if there was a um if i had seen a theme um so i'm i'm hoping for you know very light um uh you know, to get myself back into you know this group in a um you know more than what an hour and a half a week but maybe two hours a week and let's see if i can do it two and a half hours a week a month from now um but yeah a little bit of okay um can we you know, I always ask uh, an AI to um, uh, take a summary and create a novel from it, um, which is, I think, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries of uh, of, of sense there. Um, but I'm really interested in, huh, what are other people thinking? That's why I'm here. Um, I'm not sure how to you know, listen to one, how many people, 17 people on this call and like say, okay, um, let's popcorn. I'm going to ask Jerry um, two words. Why are we doing this? And Jerry's going to say, okay, he's going to pick somebody and then they're going to pick somebody until we all have two words of meaning um, among 17 people um, going very quickly um, to cover everyone in the call. Um that's in a different experiment. Um, and the purpose for me would be to find out, huh, which two words are people associating with this tactic or this, this decision? Um, I'll lower my hand. Um, thanks, Mark. I, I will point out that the check-in routine that we're in right now is an experiment that's stuck that we started in February of 2023. It is relatively recent. I was just looking in my brain and when we started doing the S protocol and the other protocols and all that kind of stuff, that's February, 2023. So before that, we were sort of ramajamming every single call. We were just diving right in and we were, we were preoccupied that we were just running at pace without actually making space for one another. And part of what we started doing was just taking a pause between comments during our salon style conversations. And then we brought in the check-ins and we brought them in for 50% of our time together which started feeling heavy for me. I, I, I was a little bit like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of check I was feeling, and I'm reasonably sensitive to group process. So I'm interested in, we just heard from a, a, a bunch of people about what it meant to them or, or how it goes. And I, I'd love to just sort of play with that a little bit. So the proposal to experiment for a couple of months with a, a little lower frequency, I think is fine. I think a quick check-in at the front is a, another good experiment. Uh, Pete or someone else may send us a questionnaire to get some baseline data and figure that out. That, that sounds great to me as well. Um, but this is a, this, the format we're in is itself an experiment. And I like that we're playing with our format some. So uh, Doug C, please. Okay, uh, here's a challenging thought that I had this week about energy. And I think I'm correct, but I'm not positive. And it goes like this. If you look at the, the exponential curve of energy use, of course, since we started talking about energy, that curve is still going up. But there's an anomaly that's really interesting. There's a bump which shows the addition of solar and wind energy to the total mix. And it turns out that if you uh, shift to some form of electric stuff without using fossil fuels to generate it, uh, you do nothing to actually cut the burning of fossil fuels. And so the proposal is that all the money and all the effort that's been spent on solar and wind uh, 
has not lowered the amount of fossil fuels used by an iota. Zero. Totally zero. It's a complete waste. So that's the thought. Maybe everybody should take a breath at this moment and uh, internalize that. Um, there are enormous things that happen in systems that are out of our control in different ways. But uh, thanks for the observation, Doug. Um, let's go Pete, Klaus, then Sam H. Um, thanks, Doug. And um, I appreciate having a, a content um, observation <laughs> during the call. Um, even though um, I, I feel like I, I wish we would talk about process a little bit more um, as well. Um, the a, a similar thing I know about, uh, I, a thing I read about is traffic and uh, adding more lanes to a freeway actually doesn't decrease the congestion. It usually increases it. Um, it's a you know, weird counterintuitive thing, kind of like uh, energy use. Um, uh, going back to check-ins, uh, I wanted to stress that um, that my hypothesis is that that 50% check-in rate um, that feels wasteful uh, feels wasteful to our engineering brains. Um, and on the flip side, it's uh, it's just uh, it's just an effect of being human. So humans need a lot of time to process and and to be together without doing content stuff. <clears throat> and the way that you get around that, the way that you engineer around that is by <clears throat> adding extra process, uh, engineering process, uh, you know, assembly lines or um, collaboration software or things like that, uh, even facilitation stuff like uh, World Cafe or something. Um, we, I, I, think, I think we have found a, a happy medium of effective moving forward and, and effective phatic drivel. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm really impressed with the work that we can kind of do together as a group brain. And um, Jerry, I, I think you kind of, I don't know, I felt like you kind of summarized that and, and that maybe, maybe I missed, maybe I'm missing, mishearing that. But I think we're actually a really effective group brain now. I, if, if it were me, what I would experiment with is not uh, reducing the frequency of check-ins. I would increase the effectiveness of our topic calls. Um, either staying on one topic longer or putting more uh, asynchronous back, uh, backbone to a topic. Um, I think that's where we're falling down. I, don't, I, think, I think personally that we're not spending too much time together chatting. Um, and I think any amount less is too, too much less. Um, but I do think that we're not being effective. And I think we're not being effective because we haven't engineered our topic stuff well enough. So uh, to stress it again, hey, folks, we're actually humans, we're not bots. Um, and humans just take a lot of social overhead, sociology. It's just the way humans work, you know, li live with it. <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks, Pete. I I was gonna say something and I've not forgotten what that was. Uh, let's go to Klaus and then Sam H. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of conflicted with um, <clears throat> how much, uh, chat chatting you do i think this forum is more focused on the personal interactions and on getting to know one another and dealing you know more on an emotional level um i'm uh, participating in a bunch of meetings where um it's all uh, uh discussion and you can't transition to um uh, a, a real practical implementation focused uh, approach. I mean, Forum for the Future, for example, uh, is, is one, one of these groups where you now we all know what needs to be changed, but we can't transition into actually changing anything. But anyway, <clears throat> come, reporting back to, to Doug's uh, uh, comment here, uh, the the overall energy production has increased incredibly, right? I mean, the the amount of solar that has been put online, wind, you know, and, and, and hydro is is remarkable. But at the same time, you have cryptocurrency and you have AI that eats it all up. So the question is, you know, should we not do AI? I mean, crypto, I think we can lose, but should we not do AI? 
Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, that's a, that's a tough uh, call because obviously you know, it, it brings uh, you know, a host of benefits in, in other ways. I mean, the, the escalation of uh, our collective knowledge is phenomenal. You know, to, and most people don't even process what, what is happening here. Uh, and on how many fronts this is all happening simultaneously, but yeah, we can't. Uh, I, I think that that uh, uh, race between adding uh, a product energy production to the to the grid and then and then using more at the same time. I mean, just think about the conversion to electric cars. Well, where is that energy coming from? Right. So the 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 more successful that is, and the faster that gets rolled out. But the more stress you will have on the energy systems, so there is no. I, I don't. I don't. I don't see a solution. But what I what I do know is that um, we apparently have passed uh, uh, several tipping points. So the Greenland ice sheets are on a melting cycle at this point that is irreversible. <clears throat> That's eight meters of water. Now, so so we have no idea how to deal with this and and what this means. And the only variable here is how fast is this going to melt um and and so there there are there are uh factors in our pretty immediate future uh, that uh, we 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 just don't really process we don't really uh, uh see that uh in in its impact now and and it's it's being being uh, pushed aside uh, in a, in a, in discussion points, and that is pretty crazy. Yeah, and, and I think this is where where Doug is saying. I mean, you look at uh, what we're doing and where we're heading, and it's just not a good place. And and we are distracted by all these political fights and and uh, disturbances. The Heritage Foundation wants to pretend none of it is happening. Let the free market take care of it. So, so we are we are in an incredibly uh, dark place when it comes to that. At the same time, you know, we we are building uh, uh, understanding and knowledge and skills, engineering skills, and so on that are actually you know that that could actually path a you know, point you know, towards towards at least adaptations, uh, solutions for adaptations. But uh, um, yeah, so um, I'm. I'm all in favor of discussions, but I think uh, um, they, they, it's pretty inescapable of, of where we are. Um, so uh, two different things. One, I worry about statements we make like this is completely irreversible. This will happen. We are definitely going here because nature does weird things and things do flip around in unexpected ways. And one of the characteristics of chaos is its unpredictability in different ways. So there are instabilities, but I, I feel like I, I wish we either had a climatologist in the room or that the AIs that are now at hand, we were using them more effectively to buttress our arguments and put positions together that if we feel really strongly about them, we can point to and say, and here's why. Uh, so we, we are in close enough relationship that we're perfectly fine having some, many of us come up and say things that are right out there. But, um, um, but, but how these arguments get built up, I think is really important and is a part of collaborative sense-making that we're not engaging in. And Klaus, I, I know that, I, I, from this list, I get so many videos and like if Schmachtenberger would only make anything short, and I know you're not pointing to one of his videos, but um, like I can't process the volume of things that come through this list just to pay attention to. Uh, so how how that gets sort of broken down into arguments that are, are visible, I, I'm, I'm really interested in. And then I want to go back a, a little bit meta to our, our process again, because one of the things that I'm realizing prompted me to go with the suggestion from last week was my frustration that we had two terrific content calls. We had one on long-termism that I really enjoyed. Then we had one on a sense of agency that I really enjoyed. And I was like, oops, there month. And if we had an agenda of topic calls that was anything longer than six, that'd be like better part of a year gone. And that frustrates me because I, I, I think that when we tackle topics, 
I learn enormously. It causes me to munch things around in my head, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a, a piece of why I was interested in giving us more space, more time in the content calls. Um, and I just wanted to put that uh, in the room, but I was, I was frustrated with our, our last two really, really great calls. Uh, that said, let me go to Mark and Rick. So one of the biggest extractive um, growth in electricity is cryptocurrency and uh, mining and certainly AI as well. Um, there are multiple AI, um, you know, data crunching um, and, and server farm um, things as, as well as just basically the web and um, the growth of the web. Um, you know, why would one put a server farm in Utah, um, which the NSA does. Well, um, there are many reasons, but hey, how much energy production is happening in Utah? Um, I do not see AI as the solution. I see people as the solution. And I certainly am very, very um, clear about that, having been an AI researcher since 1984. Now, how do I make friends and live in trust with collaborators who effectively, um, because I don't need a fondle slab with a little electronic friend to guide my life. I don't need that. I've grown up without it. And there are people who are growing up relying on it. And that scares the hell out of me. Now, um, I agree that, hey, it's not inevitable. And Jerry, here's why using AI. Well, one might do that with an expert system with chat GPT. No, chat GPT is statistical language play. And it's not going to basically give us reasons why it has reasoned out those statistical strings that it's putting together. Now it can point to other strings, or it can, you know, as um, uh, I think Gil did, um, you know, summarize these strings in what looks like it makes sense, but there is no sense behind it that is reasoning. It is a kind of statistical play. Now, that can be very valuable, but it's not reasoning and it can't be relied on. And I'm very, very clear about that. And I'm not, I would love to hear what Pete thinks about that because I think he thinks differently. Um, I'll roll over my hand. Thanks. And I apologize, but I failed to go to Sam because he, his hand wasn't in the queue. So I'd love to go to Sam H uh, and then back to the queue. Oh, thanks. Let me make uh, three quick points. Uh, but first, the zero. Thanks for uh, allowing me to join. It's been quite a while. I'm no longer conflicted on Thursday mornings. But point number one, about Doug's point on the um, overall consumption of fossil fuel. You know, anytime you take a very large complex system, and it's probably not new to most of you here, it takes a while, there's the transition, and that initial dip in efficiency, cost, whatever, is probably well anticipated. And the energy consumption is quite complex and has been there for hundreds of, well, many decades at least. So there's also a telling of the story, the narrative about what you choose to focus on and what you choose to compute that adds to or detracts from your story. So to me, it's not surprising that for short term, for the first decade or two, uh, we're gonna fail on a number of key metrics. But the key perspective there is in the long term, where do you wanna go? Do you wanna still keep burning fossil fuels or do you wanna do something else? And for now it's batteries and electricity, but eventually hopefully we'll get to a more radiative grid where we could just extract energy out of the ether, but we're not anywhere close to that yet. So we're gonna to have to have a different set of metrics. So that was point number one. Point number two is Jerry, I remember two or three years ago when you had invited a number of uh, people to talk about OGM, uh, I had thought that there was an artifact involved, you know, something you know, akin to a very large brain that we're all going to be either adding to, refining, annealing with, et cetera, et cetera. So I was curious whether that was an artifact that came out of these conversations. And if so, then it would be something to, let's say, introduce new 
uh, consider myself a new member since I haven't been here for quite a while. People to, to actually see where the curve of conversations has gone, what the topics visited has been. And maybe there is such a trail in your personal brain, Jerry, but I don't know if there's one for the OGM um, itself. And then the third point is on this, um, whether it's extractive, sorry, whether it's wasteful to do this uh, check-in time, would there be an option for those who want to focus on topics to actually stay longer than the currently scheduled end time? Uh, that's a kind of a simple solution that may or may not work, but it just seems like you know something to uh, consider as well as, hey, set up another whole thread or parallel uh, series of events, maybe on the same Zoom link, but on a different day or a different time for those who just want to focus on uh, the backlog of topics. So anyway, those are three very quick thoughts I want to uh, participate with. Thanks for uh, letting me have about a minute of time. Over. Uh, Sam, thank you so much. Um, we've had a couple different efforts to create an OGM artifact. You are correct that that was one of the goals up front. That was one of the things I was hoping for. Um, we had a uh, mapathon kind of early on where we picked a topic, we spent some time on it, and then three or four people or five or six people using different tools compared notes on how they had recorded that incident. And we didn't do that again, which is probably my error to not go back to it, but I didn't feel like there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. I have in the past and not for a long time now, encourage people to uh, share their note-taking more vigorously and more into a common space. Uh, and that hasn't happened very much. So I think I've given up a bit on that. As you noted, I am every single call. I'm you know, busy weaving and curating everything we do and, and touch into my brain. And I publish that openly, but that that and four bucks will get you a coffee at Starbucks. Um, and so, and so there have been some efforts. And then in the Free Jury's Brain Calls on Monday, we've tried to liberate me from the brain software and create something that would be more of a joint effort. And we're still in the try mode. We haven't, uh, Pete has made noble efforts to connect my brain to GPT because the brain has an API and we could then have a bot sort of query my map. And then if it could query other people's maps, then maybe we can have the bots go solve everything by talking to one another um, or some crazy scenario like that. Uh, so that Mark's head would explode like while on camera, which would be really cool. That would go viral. And then we'd be like a popular group. Um, so there've been a bunch of different attempts. And I, I will confess that I've kind of given up on creating that artifact. Um, I, I bought, I, I own the domain, thebigfungus.org because I love mycelial metaphors and I have trouble describing the space within which we might share what we believe and what we know with one another. And so I think it's, it's I, I call it the big fungus. And I think that the, the name of this thing should be a little tongue in cheek as well. Uh, so I feel like I want my brain data to be an inoculation into the big fungus. And I'm really interested in everybody else who wants to contribute their inoculations to this thing as well, whatever it ends up being called. I have a reasonably good track record of seeing what's coming, a terrible track record of naming it properly. Uh, I called weblogs the zines, and they ended up being called weblogs. But I wrote about them a couple of years before they ever got popular. Um, so, so I, I think I think your instincts on this are Mary match my instincts pretty well. But my ability to um, uh, shepherd instead of stewarding is really limited here, and uh, it hasn't sort of popped out of here uh, in in a way that I would that 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 would satisfy the thing I think you're curious about and that I would wish we had. Does that, does that kind of answer? Yes, thanks. I have follow-up, but I know there are other people who are in line. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, Rick. Thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give a perspective of, of an infrequent flyer um, because I think um, one of the, the challenges is how do we uh, unleash the power of weak ties uh, I remember reading a book many years ago about the weak ties of how if you can orchestrate weak ties, you can create more influence rather than a small group of very strong ties. And it ties in with uh, uh, Gill's uh, comments at the very beginning about Dave Snowden's book, uh, his work rather, which is what matters is not the dots. It's the, it's the interrelational processes between the dots and how they have continuity coherence over time. 
And the question is, how can you orchestrate that in such a way that the infrequent flyers can feel like they can pop in, get something out of it? And if, as Pete was describing, there was an asynchronous platform other than email, which I find not a very friendly platform for tracking things, um, you know, how can how can we create some synergy uh, between synchronous and asynchronous so that you can have some longevity on the topics rather than being standalone topics? Because that's what we need. We, we, need, lo we need continuity of, of experience dealing with something that is not only in depth, but working at a meta level so we can influence and change our dysfunctional systems. So last week I did uh, uh, put out, a, um, published a LinkedIn article uh, and invited people to comment. I'll do the same this time, but I, I, I'm not going to be able to comment until probably in the new year anyway. But the idea is if, if somebody were to publish something and it was discussed, released at the end, you can publish it on a different platform, come to LinkedIn, and everyone start commenting on it soon afterwards to create some sort of uh, network power on it and try and generate it. I've had only one very successful LinkedIn article that just blew up a couple of years ago. I have no idea how it happened, uh, but it did. Um, but it's a question of how can you actually create, um, you know, I mean, what Klaus was talking earlier about some of the more specific areas. But then if you zoom out and look at the, the, the middle level, how do you begin to create influence at the middle level so that you can address the question I put in the, in the chat? And I, I have to leave at the top of the hour. But I'll, I'll put a link into a, an article if people are interested, that's fine. Uh, but I would encourage you to think about how do you take it outside of the confines of this group? If it's open, then open it up and have a platform where other people can see and witness and observe some of the great work or discussions there are so that it might actually amplify its influence. Uh, what Rick is describing, we've been doing a bit in neo books. Uh, we call them neo books pops, where we critique one person's writing, and then that person tells us when they're going to launch it, and then we try to retweet, amplify, etc. I think we put one of those on the OGM list and said, "Hey, anybody who wants to add some energy to this now." We haven't done it in a in a really con concentrated, collimated fashion, but but we we do have some energy behind that. Go ahead, Rick. If I can just just quickly respond to that, I would say. Try and implement it here on a regular basis so that you can have continuity of threads on the topics that people really got something out of so that they can still, you know, cross fertilize over time and try and create that an open platform rather than one that uh, a closed platform where you have to be and become a member. Um, yes. And I, I think I forgot to say when I was talking earlier is that uh, Pete and I have had many a conversation about the thing he's building with as massive wiki and what its potential is. And it's meant to be an open shareable platform using kind of lowest common denominator components like Markdown uh, to enable, to facilitate that kind of, of idea sharing, et cetera, et cetera. With that, uh, over to you, Pete. Um, thanks, Jay. And um, uh, Sam H, thanks for the question. <laughs> um, uh, we've done kind of, we've done a so-so job of, of creating a good artifact. Um, and we don't have a good strategy right now to to make it better. Um, my my feeling at this juncture is I wish it were I wish it were a wiki, but uh, my feeling is uh, that it should be a, a discourse server like we used to have with OGM forum. Um, I'm building at least one or two uh, discourse based communities um, as we speak, and I I and I would love to have a, a larger conversation why. Why I think Discourse is a is a good platform, and where I think OGM might go with it, um, uh, maybe not today. Um, but um, but let's let's talk more about that. I'm I'm really excited about uh, the Discourse communities I'm building, and um, and I think it would be the the best thing for um, OGM. Uh, even though we have a mailing list and a chat server um, and a wiki, uh, they're, they're not doing what we need to do. And I think Discourse would, and we kind of proved it actually with OGM Forum. Um, really quickly, I wanted to kind of uh, respond to Mark's question, you know, Pete, what do you think about AI? I, I, I think we, <clears throat> we probably, excuse me, <clears throat> we agree more than, than you think probably Mark, um, but, but I also disagree a little bit. 
uh, uh, GPT-40, I, I observe it re reasoning a little bit because of its mixture of experts. Um, uh, Cloud 3.5 Sonnet is definitely reasoning. And of course, 01 now is reasoning. Um, it's not reasoning or thinking the way people do, but uh, it, it is reflective on what it's trying to do and accomplish. Um, I think uh, even, even the ones that aren't reasoning, um, uh, quote unquote, uh, they, they're really good. The AI, the, the things that, that synthesize language, um, if you don't think of them as oracles, but as um, uh, training wheels or uh, assistive aids for human focus, uh, human uh, ability to distill things from bigger things, stuff like that. Uh, to make sense. Um, Mark is totally right that ChatGPT doesn't make, make sense of anything. It's not a sense-making engine. It's a kind of a collating engine. But uh, if, if you use it right, that's extremely powerful for humans and makes them a lot better and, and able to be human better, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, better human, uh, humans uh, in, uh, singly and also collectively. Um, so longer story, I don't want to I, I don't want to take over this conversation with AI, and I'm not even sure OGM is the right forum for it. Um, I've got other forums uh, for it, um, but uh, but there you go. Thanks. There it is. Uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, Klaus, then Stacy, then John. Yeah, I was just uh, coming along the same lines, <clears throat> talking about AI. I mean, I you know when when we first got into it, compared AI to the introduction of an Excel spreadsheet. So when, when spreadsheets came out, um, they totally changed the way accounting work was being done. Um, and accountants were all freaking out, uh, thinking they would lose uh, their jobs. When in all reality, they had a tool that allowed them to do you know, amazingly more sophisticated uh, evaluations. So AI in on in and by itself, <clears throat> Is a tool. It simply depends on a how you uh, train it, uh, how you personalize it, and then b how you actually use it. But I just uh, summarized uh, the project twenty twenty five. You know, one thousand two hundred pages, and it took seven seconds to summarize and extract the key issues that I'm interested in. Now imagine the time saving of, uh, of something like this. And in the same way, when Excel came about, once you had your model built. Right, you could you could uh, play what if games and change some numbers and see how results changed. So I, I treat AI like it's a super advanced spreadsheet, uh, um, and I couldn't do what I'm doing in in regard to the neo book I'm working on or uh, the strategies that I'm uh, developing to support uh, my my uh, NGOs in the food and agriculture sector without that technical tool. So there's a confusion when you think of IA as this persona, it's not, it's a damn tool, right? And so, and so when, when you look at it from that perspective, think about what it does to, to technologies like CRISPR, you know, or uh, in the development of batteries uh, and, and, and in chemicals and so on. It's unbelievable uh, what, a, what a boost it is you know, to, to uh, uh, human engineering skills and all of that. Um, Klaus, out of curiosity, um, when GPT came back with the report on Project 2025, did you check to see that the citations actually exist in the report, which is available for reading? Yeah. I mean... Do you match them up? Because because this thing will hallucinate a really great... like. Part of the problem is that it doesn't it doesn't keep direct quotes of everything. It's not a it's not like Google, which stores an index version of stuff. Uh, it's actually just got a pattern of stuff. Uh, so it's it's not likely to make everything perfectly accurate on the way out. No, and it sometimes uh, uh, shortcuts uh, things that you would be interested in. And so yeah, I mean it is absolutely not uh, a a like a perfect tool. But I find. Um, uh, I, I have not found a lot of hallucinations in the in in my chatbot. I mean, yeah. I really haven't because I'm dealing with very uh, uh, with uh, uh, robust engineering issues, right? I mean, that's. Uh, um, I mean, in fact, I haven't uh, been. I have not come across a hallucination where it made up some stuff. You know, so I'm sure that exists in some places, but 
uh, and people talk about it, but I haven't seen it. Cool, cool. Thanks. Uh, Stacey? I'm going to try to shift what my original comment was because more stuff just came in. Um, so one thing I want to say is if we could take what Doug Carmichael said and Klaus's pushback and put those two things together and make it into a question that would bring people that have some interest and expertise into it, that we could really have a useful conversation that would really be valuable. Um, our check-ins have been so valuable. We've been doing it for four years. At this point, we've sort of created a culture where we listen in a way that's gonna translate when we go somewhere else. So I think, and, and we've always spoken about similar type of issues. So that commonality was already built in. If we can specialize it a little more, for example, the conversation that would be about the environment and AI would bring in other people that are still gonna pick up on our culture of the way we listen, but it's gonna be more, put it this way, nobody's interested in hearing about my dating life or you know my motherhood struggles. That doesn't mean they're not interested in other parts of me that might relate to what we're talking about. And if we could just, I think very naturally, we would organize differently if we had a question where we're dissecting first what the different pieces are. It would bring people in. Um, and I just want to point out that use, and this kind of goes to what Mark Prensky, one of the things he said, because his thing is don't take the phone away from the kids. That's not the issue. And he talks about the smartphone as being a portal to their imagination and connectivity and all those things, which I really agree. But I just, just if you think out into the future of like what Klaus is doing and a group doing that around him, one, one, you know, one person feeding it for the group, as opposed to if all nine of us were doing that separately, that's energy efficient right there. That's community right there. That's a new way of doing things together. So yeah, not the most articulate way of saying it, but you guys can figure out the pieces that matter to you. Thank you so much. Um, John, how Hi, uh, I'm driving on the bridge. I suggest maybe you take someone else and then come back to me. And then I'll Eyes be on the road. Eyes on the road. Okay, good. I, I think, no, I, okay, I know. Come back to me after. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Rick, were you signaling you wanted to talk? Nope. Okay, good. Um, anyone else with thoughts? Mark. Um, I want to note that Stacy, thank you for being here, Stacy, is one woman among what 12 ish participants other participants maybe 10 ish given recordings and iphones and who knows what um also i would love to hear from ken about hey can we facilitate on these meetings i haven't heard from jose um i'm not sure if john warner is um uh yeah it looks like oh is that a picture and he's driving no, no he's, he's actually live, and there's Jose. Um, I don't think I've heard from Doug. Um, I don't think I've heard from Ken, um, but just a tiny bit. And before this call is over, um, what do what do they think? I'm I'm really I want to encourage somehow. Number one, more women, please. My God, how 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 have we gotten to this space? That it just boggles my mind that a lot of the women I've talked to say I would never, ever, ever come to this boys club. And I'm sad and I encourage them and say, no, 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 you know, it's we're we're trying, please come. And they don't. Um and I've said my piece. I'd love to hear from Ken, um, from John, from Jose and, and Doug B. Um before our call is uh is over. Um, two things, Mark. 
And I'm not going to push them to do that. That's fine. Um, two things. Diversity is a perennial problem here. We've tried in a couple of different ways to fix it. Uh, many people in this room have brought women into the conversation, and I don't know. I, I would love a good diagnosis of why we don't have more representation. Uh, second, it is not the objective of our content calls to hear from everybody, and some people are doing dishes or doing work while just listening to us on the side, which is totally cool. I have no intention or particular desire to make sure we hear from everybody on these calls. On a check-in call, it's fine to pass, but we do want to make a round of the room. So the check-in call is the place to be complete about the circuit. Um, but I, I, you know, if if Doug or John want to jump in, uh, that's that's great, no problem. Uh, John Kelly, whenever you're parked, uh, please feel free to unmute and uh, jump in with what you wanted to say. Um, cool. Why don't we take a moment and take a breath? Because I could use a moment. And maybe others can as well. Yeah, I'm not enough for you. <laughs> I say nothing. So let's uh, let's be quiet for a moment, and then uh, John Warner, you can bring us out of the silence when you'd like. I personally, I'm happy to speak now, but I don't want to interrupt anybody's silence. Go for it. Um, we can be silent after you're done. Yeah, I just you know want to respond to to Mark's prompt and. Um, someone described themselves um, as an infrequent flyer, which I think they meant they're not here often, but I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure that that's what they meant. Um, but I think as, as one of the, well, and Sam uh, introduced himself as a new newcomer, I, I feel like I'm a newcomer. So my propensity to listen rather than speak is largely that um, I would well, and for me, the the 17 people at this level of intellect, you know, talking in in where we're using terms that I don't, you know, that I don't use in a day to day. I, it's it's a hundred percent effort just to keep up with the dialogue. And then you throw the chat in on the side. And this this is just a lot um, for a for a person that's not conditioned to it. And so I think the this may be an answer to your question about you know women or men or anyone else new coming um the the uh the gradient you know that you have to go through to enter this dialogue is pretty steep um for someone of, of my intellect so um yeah so anyway that that's a that's a comment um there was a little bit of dialogue on the side about maps um i'm an engineer and i'm map maker, like literal, literal cartographer somewhat, um, and, but, but a big fan of maps. And I think some type of a map um, to guide, uh, yeah, the universe of what's being discussed here. Um, and potentially maybe the utility of a map would, would, would help focus, um, you know, some of the commentary and some of the dialogue to uh, I, we either want to talk about everything or, or today we want to talk about this. And, and I think what, you know, like setting that stage, because again, a newbie doesn't know the goal of the conversation necessarily, nor the landscape. And so I think, I think a map for, for, especially for a new person would be pretty well, potentially. And, and I also agree with Mark's comment. Um, yeah, the map maker understands the map much better than anyone else understands the map. Um, but also as Gil said, a, a brilliantly constructed map is worth a thousand words, right? So we've got the thousand words, but we don't have the map. So I, I, I'd, uh, I'd vote for, a, I'd, I'd participate in a conversation about map making. That'd be really interesting to me. John, I want to thank you for your courage to come in and basically change my mind about, you know, definitely encouraging people who aren't talking to talk. Um, Jerry, we have <laughs> agreement there. Thanks, Mark. Disagreements are great. Woohoo! Uh, one thing I do do now and then is when we've had a very busy call, I ask everybody who's been participating a lot to step back so that people who don't 
aggressively try to take space, have a moment to step in, et cetera. I see that Dave Gray is no longer with us um, on the call. Uh, yeah, that's quite a dramatic way of putting that. Um, and and Dave is someone who does great maps. I'm wondering maybe we should have a call or a series of calls on how to map conversations. Uh, we could look at David Sibbett's book, Visual Meetings, and and start to come together and say, all right, let's let's experiment with mapping our conversations. That might be a way to. Um, deepen our both our coverage and our our integration and recollection of all of that um, and bring us to some deeper places. So I just want to throw that out. Thanks, Ken. It's a good idea. Um, John, are you in a safe undisclosed location now? I am a, I'm in a disclosable parked location. So yes, I am safe. Thank you. Thank awesome. you for the uh, uh, bending this thing a little. Um, yeah, there's a lot of points that have been covered that are uh, quite rich. Um, I'll just try to link a few. There was the conversation about weak links and leveraging weak links. This is great. This is something that uh, we do better. Actually, I think it's something we do. And that then that's the difference between um, a purpose-oriented group, a group that says, hey, what do, what do we agree that we could act on and then tries to act on it? The difference between the um shepherding and stewarding as you said so yes i i mean i get it you know i i think we this is a great stewarded place and then we subgroups of us go off and get into more purpose-oriented activities and then come back and, and share about it i mean that's that's the model that that works for me um so that said uh, there are a couple of more points that have gone by that are uh, not retrievable, but um, there's a big paper that uh, Kalia is working on and I'm helping her with it, edit, and a lot of people, including um, Grace, who came to us a few times, you know, and then dropped out. I mean, there's a lot of really good thought going into this paper and it's on the Internet Engineering Task Force and the process that they use. And I was frankly, you know, sideswiped by I, I did not realize how evolved uh, from a facilitation standpoint and from a democracy standpoint uh, this whole thing is you know because I, I missed some important parts of the history I knew a few things about conflict between the IETF and other groups but it's really an amazing story I, I don't think it's a story about I don't think it's a story of something we should copy at all because it's a very, the, the cool thing about it is it's intense, but it's intense and in how it manages to move without, say, voting, without specific, oh, how many votes do we have for this? It, it, it's moving, it has a design that, that moves towards action and manages to um, delay or push aside irrelevant stuff. Uh, in a way that is satisfying to the people who get pushed aside. And that is just, that's a breakthrough. You know, uh, I'm not sure how translatable it is because, I mean, one of the things that makes it work is running code. You have, you have, you have a proposal, you have things that involve humans and how humans are going to act, but you have to have running code that links up somehow with that. And the code has to run on two very different machines. And that's part of their criteria for, uh, an acceptable proposal. I don't know that there's an equivalent in our universe, although I can backcast and imagine a really interesting one that would involve something like um, net zero or net negative carbon, you know, but I mean, that that's that's a future project, you know, to, to illustrate that. Anyhow, this paper is coming. Uh, we're, she's working on it this week and last week, and uh, I'm pretty sure it'll be public. It was it was funded by the Ethereum Foundation. And uh, as soon as it's public, I'll give you guys um, links and uh, look forward to uh, following up on it. That Thank sounds you. great, John. That sounds great, John. Thank you. And IETF is sort of the modern ITU or International Telecommunications Union. And it works in the opposite manner of the ITU. And it creates opposite exactly. dynamics in ways that are super fruitful, but the pressures on them aren't really different from the pressures that were on the ITU. So it's fascinating 
that they've made a really good go of that and still are. I, I'm yeah. looking, looking forward to reading Kalia's paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I had I had no idea that was in the works or that that was uh, some of the things you described. Um, Sam H, please. So sorry, I dropped out for a little bit, but um, I just heard a bit uh, of what was being discussed as I returned. Um, one of the things I really, really love about the whole internet evolution story is how they got decentralized, uh, not much power mongering set of individuals, although some people may disagree, to actually create something that works. I think that's a real good test to actually have something that works. If you don't have a real good test, then you can't be clear what your criteria are, what your success metrics are, even a test suite, you know, you don't have when you really don't know what the objective is. So the fact that the network has to stay up, that numbers have to be assigned, that RFCs have to be considered, they have to be voted on, decisions have to get made, code has to be uh, written, is a key thing. Now, that takes me to my second point, and that is, in uh, some of the groups that I uh, help facilitate on weekends, and in many that I do participate in, obviously, you know, much of the focus now is how do we AI properly, right? Uh, we don't know that. And it's such a key, I would say, force changing how people live and how societies uh, engage with each other. There's all kinds of doomsday scenarios as well as, you know, rah, rah, you know, utopia scenarios. Obviously, neither is going to be uh, correct as long as we keep operating just on speculation and shallowness. But the whole key here, I think, is how do we do AI better? I'm actually quite um, impressed that there are groups looking at the ethics of AI, and I didn't, I didn't anticipate that. I didn't anticipate that a lot of the AI, I, I certainly nobody could have told me five or 10 or 20 years ago that all this work would be open sourced. Now, I'm sure that there are people that are taking the open source and trying to bend it to their will and not be quite so open. You know, we've got to be prepared for that. But how we AI is such a key theme now that to me, it's not something we should be shying away from. It's something we should be embracing and really, you know, thinking deeper than most people who just want another 10K per month, you know, income or whatever that turns out to be. O1 Preview, for example, is beginning to show us the reasoning capability might be possible even if you disagree that it's there yet, okay? So I think that it's it's impressive. I, it's certainly further along than I would have thought a simple set of, you know, matrices, you know, uh, on a bunch of vectors uh, would, have, would have taken us. I would not have anticipated that just 10 or 15 years ago. And then 13, my last point here on this uh, go around is if you guys are looking at metrics on, you know, why things are happening and why people show up, this is actually, I'm looking at a board of at least 15, 16, 17 uh, rectangles. And I think this is a pretty good uh, metric actually. Many groups after three, four years don't have this many still going, still choosing to come and spend this time. So if you take a look at that as a metric from an outsider, you got, you know, this is, this is actually doing well, over. Thank you, Sam, appreciate that a lot. Uh, Doug B. Muted. Uh, you're, you you took your hand down, but you didn't unmute. I, I, uh, I spend my time sort of preoccupied with where human being meets human doing um, in service to figuring out how humans could do humans better, in their, both in their impacts in the world and in relation to each other. And um, in work with Jose on on our protocols, our communities, and with Carl on his contributions framework, um, Wendy McLean and her mapping of folks doing devotional work in the same soft territories, um, and my own immersion with the elements and, and so on. Um, there's the human piece of how I do me, how a group of people navigate each other, which speaks to that check-in piece, like getting to know you, uh, getting to feel on a felt sense basis. 
and and what somebody um, what constitutes safety for everybody in the room, which is a a, a dimension of humans co-creating together that in the culture outside the window in Mughal world is doesn't really enter the conversation. But it's actually huge, you know. Um, Jose isn't here on camera, but I saw him on the attendant list. You know, he and I have spent spent a good three years in conversation, unattached to doing, getting to the place where we're now collaborators. And in a kind of flow in relation to each other. Um, that took three years. I, I've been working with Carl for uh, probably going on five, four hours a week um, to help in service to help him bring his gifts out to me with the contributions framework, which is a wholesale replacement for the disability orientation to those not in the normal part of the bell curve. Um, Whether something is purpose-driven or not, in my experience, has a lot to do with doing and outputs and productivity and rest. Like what's the it that uh, collectively a group of people want to co-create together? And then there are contexts where it's not about the it, it's about connection. It's about on a human level, on a felt sense level, it's from a connected place. How does a group of people explore, learn, um, pioneer, um, and and tackle what else? And being okay <laughs> with um, being directed and purpose driven, not being directed and purpose driven, being okay with silence being okay with creating enough space for everybody in the room to actually grapple and process the incoming, which in this place is like, you know, Niagara Falls, um, uh, and have enough time to actually respond or engage or not, um, takes a huge amount of patience and grace that, that culturally does not come easy to most people today. Um, and this place provides that. Like, could I love a lot more of that? You know, and I think Pete sort of touched that a little bit too. Yeah, um, but it's a lot by normal standards. This place is very gracious and spacious. So um, that's my contribution, but I, with nothing but gratitude for this being here and the privilege and, and ability to be part of it. That's all I got. It looks like we lost Jerry. Yeah, Sam, you should go. Oh, uh... What I, what I have to say is going to be so banal after that. Beautiful <laughs> uh, statement. But um, I guess what I'm, what I think I would like is like a list of, you know, I, I constantly hear these people spouting about projects that they're in where they're collaborating with other people. And um, it just kind of, it's, it's, it's all sort of going by so quickly. And I wonder if there's a page where, I could kind of look around and see what people are doing and, you know, what collaborative projects people are involved in. That would be like one good map of content, I think. Just, I'd be curious about it. That's it. Um, I'll kind of take that one. We don't have such a thing. Uh, we've wished for such a thing. Um, uh, if you get Jerry or maybe me, there's a few other people that you could get on a call and say, hey, tell me all the things that are going on. Uh, we could tell you a lot of it. Um, uh, you might be interested uh, in my newsletter that comes out twice a week. It covers a tiny bit of what we do. Um, uh, and 
by the way, conversely, folks who haven't been contributing to the Plex, um, I'll, I'll, it's called uh, Biweekly Plex Dispatch, so I'll put a link in the chat. Um, uh, people who haven't been contributing to the Plex, I would love to hear more about what you're doing. Uh, and the Plex is a good way to write like paragraph or two paragraphs. Here's what I'm doing. Watch what Kevin Jones does in the Plex. That's all you need to do. Um, it's super helpful for everybody. Uh, thanks. Uh, by the way, Sam, I we we've actually had a couple attempts. At, let's do that map of content of what OGM is is doing, uh, and there are some subgroups. Uh, uh, you might be particularly interested in Fellowship of the Link, which is uh, a, a co-group with um, OGM. Uh, and uh, we actively kind of talk about that kind of stuff, um, and not just for OGM, but, but in general. Um, Fellowship of the Link you can find on, on Mattermost. Uh, and uh, we meet uh, Wednesdays at 11 AM Pacific. Sounds great. Thanks, Pete. Um, Sam. And then we're getting close to the end of our call time. Okay, thanks. Um, Doug knows this. I'm uh, kind of in a five to seven year conversation with Doug and Stacy on and off regarding this topic of safety. And I used to believe that we bring our own safety. There's a contrasting view that the group provides the safety. To me, that second perspective is very compassionate, very empathic, but very tenuous and very, very dynamic and highly fragile. So at times I go back to saying, we bring our own safety. We figure out whether we can, you know, listen to criticism, listen to different opinions, have disagreements in a civil way, be open and curious and generous to new opinions, you know, not have things trigger us, not have uh, past patterns take over. It's a difficult topic and it requires a lot of each participant. But if I'm looking at what the highest performing teams I imagine could exist, they want to take us out of our current level of civilization and help us level up. That's what I imagine. If you want participation, if you want people to feel good, then the group has to take on more responsibility of providing that safety. But then you do spend more time doing that versus spending it on the, let's say, stated or chartered objective or purpose of a group. There's not a clear answer unless the group defines that for itself. So I think a lot of that has to do with how you define and create and you know set up the group. And if you set it up after the group is already established, somebody's gonna be disappointed. Um, Sam, groups that don't mind safety at all often get really jammed and borked because they failed to do so. I mean, it's kind of a group formation thing that ought to be taken care of somehow. I agree. But that's because people don't bring their own safety to those groups. And, and it feels like it, it feels like almost by definition, the process of entering a group is the meeting of your own safety sphere and, and preconceptions and history with whatever the group is presenting as safety or even explicitly doing for safety, right? Isn't that always the case? I take a look at some of the interactions at the highest levels of, let's say, what what passes for international diplomacy or discourse, whatever, you could say those are barbed wires, you know, there's not much safety there. And yet we have to pass those hurdles. We have to level up beyond that in order for us to have, actually have a chance to survive beyond 50 years or 30. So yeah, you could say most groups, especially the neighborhood uh, coffee clutches and others, you know, yeah, you know, you want to feel safe among those. But there's a time and a place for hard problems to be addressed head on. And Hey, at that point, you know, Putin's not going to provide safety for Harris. Harris is not going to provide safety for Putin. They have to come prepared to deal with things, you know, no matter what the circumstance. And we could model that, but it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel comfortable. It doesn't feel safe. So we have to figure out what we want. Over. 
Um, thanks, Sam. Uh, very briefly, it's, it's kind of cool that Mike Nelson just stepped into the call because he has a lot of experience in the topic I'm about to talk about. Uh, the norms of diplomatic discourse are often the thing that tries to create safety or some buffer zone in political national level discussions. And then when people want to have, you know, prevent prevent that from happening, they create conflict and destroy things. One of one of Trump's best tactics in his playbook are the destruction of norms and the destruction of the things that create safety for other people. And oh my God, he's actually a, a, a black belt at doing this kind of thing. Um, we're a, a little bit over time. We're about to wrap the call. Sam Shikowitz, you had put um, some code in the uh, chat earlier and you were in the queue earlier. I was wondering if you wanted a little time to explain what that was or, or anything else. Oh, I just uh, kind of whipped up a little like um, way to hack a, a, um, a map of content. Um, I, I created a Google document instead of putting all that code stuff in there. So if you want to see the link, um, just a Google document you can look at. Just I thought it might be kind of fun to use AI to sort of scrape all of the content and kind of cluster it all together into maps of content where people could interact with the data. I think it would take $10,000 or something like that to do, but or more if we did a lot of the work ourselves and et cetera, but just an idea. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me. I'm going to jump you, off. I got two kids sure? yelling. Oh, What's good. That? Do you mind sharing a link to that document on the OGM list so we can sort of take a look at it together? Yes, I will do that. That'd be okay. great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think at this point I go to Ken and say, hast thou a poem for us? I do. You hast. I do. I do. Uh, a little unusual move today. I, I, I've been listening to this conversation. I couldn't find a poem. So I'm going to go with something that I, I had in mind anyway for a different purpose. I want to dedicate this poem to J.D. Vance. Oh, it's nice. called Hatred by Vistava Zimborska. See how efficient it is. How it keeps itself in shape. Our century's hatred. How easily it vaults over the tallest obstacles. How rapidly it pounces, tracks us down. It's not like other feelings, at once both older and younger. It gives birth itself to the reasons that give it life. When it sleeps, it's never eternal rest. And sleeplessness won't sap its strength. It feeds it. One religion or another, whatever gets it ready, in position, one fatherland or another, whatever helps it get a running start. Justice also works well at the outset until hate gets its own momentum going. Hatred, hatred, its face twisted in a grimace of erotic ecstasy. Oh, those other feelings, listless weaklings. Since when does brotherhood draw crowds? Has compassion ever finished first? Does doubt ever really rouse the rabble? Only hatred has just what it takes. Gifted, diligent, hardworking. Need we mention all the songs it has composed? All the pages it has added to our history books? All the human carpets it has spread over countless city squares and football fields? Let's face it, it knows how to make beauty. The splendid fire glow in the midnight skies Magnificent bursting bombs in rosy dawns. You can't deny the inspiring pathos of ruins and a certain body humor to be found in the sturdy column jutting from their midst. Hatred is the master of contrast between explosions and dead quiet, red blood and white snow. Above all, it never tires of its leitmotif, the impeccable executioner towering over its soiled victim. It's always ready for new challenges. If it has to wait a while, it will. They say it's blind. Blind? It has a sniper's keen sight and gazes unfin unflinchingly at the future as only it can. I believe the proper response to that is, holy crap. <laughs> um, and where uh, do we find it? 
I'll, I put a post, uh, I put a link to the post just above yours, Mike, in the chat. The Peabody Library link is oh, a link to this okay, poem. Thank you. And for those who don't know, Wystawa Zimborska was a Polish uh, woman writer, a uh, poet, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I think, in 96. And um, she writes really dark poems with a very light voice. It's quite astonishing. Um, and oftentimes when I read her work, people will assume it's a man's because she has a very masculine tone to her, but she's a, an astonishingly great writer, and I highly recommend her works. Totally agree. Um, I will recommend that everybody look at the list of Nobel recipients for literature and read Par Lagerqvist and Yasunari Kawabata and all those wonderful people who've won that prize. It's humanity, um, highly, highly distilled, amazing stuff. Cool. I thank you all for another great call. Uh, we will enter an experimental period and uh, see how the experiment goes. And uh, if we can, if we're lucky, we'll measure it, et cetera, et cetera. But thank you for for this call. Appreciate it. Can we announce the theme yeah. before before a call? So we can uh, we need to do better on collaborating on themes. Uh, we're not using Mattermost very much or enough, and I'd love for us to use it to actually talk about themes in that way. I get occasional pings from from individuals that are like, "Hey, hey, let's talk about this." And sometimes, often, I will go with those, and sometimes I don't. But I would like us to collaborate more on creating the themes together. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Bye, everybody.